One of the most arresting scenes in the movie version of Lord of the Rings is when Frodo comes to visit Galadriel. Now, Frodo is the ring bearer, and his job is to deliver the ring of power to the fires of Mount Doom. And this is a difficult and overwhelming task for Frodo to have to do. And so on his way, he stops in Lothlorien, which is the realm of Galadriel. She is an angel-like figure, a good and a noble person who gives him resp and rest and respite on his journey towards Mordor, where Sauron, the Satan-like figure, uh, is waiting along with the fires of Mount Doom. And this ring of power that Frodo has, uh, it's a symbol in the Lord of the Rings for power. And especially a major theme in the book and in the movies is the corrosive nature of power. That those who have power end up being uh, jaded by it, transformed by it. And so most people in the movie and in the book want to take the ring from Frodo and use it for their own ends. But what's so powerful about this scene is that Frodo, who is uh, worn out from having to carry this heavy burden, actually offers the ring to Galadriel sort of of his own free will. And what follows is really a superbly acted scene that Galadriel, as she reaches out for the ring, you can see her hand trembling in the movie. And as she goes through and, and reveals that to be honest, she has wanted this ring for a long time and she has thought what would happen if she ever was given the kind of power that comes with this ring. And the reason why we're showing you still shots and not the actual clip is it's actually a little bit frightening uh, because when Galadriel reveals the fact of what would happen if she took this ring, it's sort of a terrible and dark version of this angelic-like feature and sort of the fear and the anger is supposed to be meant to show all of us in the viewing audience that even though she is a good, noble, angel-like person, if she were to take this power, it would corrupt her and through her, it would do horrendous and wicked things. And then the final kind of shot of the scene is that after she passes the test, after she refuses to take power, you see her sort of panting uh, as she's exhausted in this temptation. Well, the scene is known as the temptation of Galadriel, and we believe that J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, based this scene on our passage this morning, which is the temptation of Jesus. And one of the powerful things about this scene is we are meant to see that even though Galadriel is an angel-like creature, she is genuinely tempted by the power that is offered to her, and it takes everything within her being to fight off that temptation. So too we are supposed to see as we come to this time of Jesus being tempted. We're not supposed to think of him. He is the Son of God, but he is also 100% totally, completely human. And that in his temptation, it takes everything that he has to resist the temptations of Satan. But in doing so, he shows us a way that you and I can overcome the temptations that are so common in our lives. So let me ask, if you will, would you take, please take a Bible and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you'd like to borrow a Bible, it would honor us greatly if you took one from the rack in front of you. In those Bibles, it's page 785. We would love for you to follow along with us to see this incredible story. It's one of the most powerful and important stories in the Bible and really throughout history as people have reflected on Jesus going through this very intense, very human, very powerful temptation at the hands of Satan, the tempter. Matthew chapter 4, page 785. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This scene is referred to as the temptation of Jesus. It is not called the temptations, plural, of Jesus. And that's because although there are three different temptations, they're at the heart all the same. In fact, all temptation is actually at the heart the same thing. The Bible sometimes calls it pride, sometimes calls it selfishness, but at the heart of every temptation that Jesus experienced, at the heart of every temptation that you and I experience, is this desire to put ourselves where God should be. That with each temptation, Satan is trying to get Jesus to make decisions for himself for what might be in his own best interest instead of yielding and submitting to what God the Father wants for him. So too with every temptation we have experienced, will experience, Satan does the same thing with us. It is a temptation for us to put ourselves at the center of our lives, for us to be the ones making the decisions, for us to be the ones who decide how our lives are going to go. That instead of letting God be on the throne of our lives, we take that spot. Now that shows itself in many, many different ways, which is why although there's just one temptation, it shows itself in three different forms for Jesus. So too for us, this one temptation to displace God with ourselves, to forget about God and think only about ourselves, this selfishness, this pride, can take many forms. So let's look this morning at three of the forms it can take, the three that Jesus was tempted with. The first, verse two, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And in one of the great understatements of the Bible, it says he was hungry. And so Satan comes to him and says, look, you can solve this problem yourself. You have the ability to take care of this. You are the son of God, he says, if, but what he means is, you're the son of God, go ahead and do something about this. You have the power to be able to simply tell these stones to become bread. Now we gotta be very clear what the temptation is. It is most definitely not a sin for Jesus to eat. He's human. This is what he's supposed to do. It's also not a sin for Jesus to turn stones into bread. It's not a sin for him to use his miraculous power to create food. In fact, in Matthew 14, just a few chapters later, Jesus is also going to be in the wilderness, and there's going to be a lot of hungry people, including himself, and what he will do is use his divine power to miraculously create food to feed himself and at least 5,000 other people. That's not a sin. There's nothing inherently wrong with Jesus using his power to create food. So what is the temptation? The temptation is for Jesus to solve the cravings of his flesh himself. Satan is tempting Jesus to take matters into his own hands. You're hungry? 
You can fix that problem. You want to eat? You can have that. And the temptation is the same for us today. Me trying to satisfy the cravings that I have myself. For some time, the Lord has been trying to get across to me that I, me, (laughs) have an idolatry of food. It's taken a long time to sort of come to grips with this. But the idea that I have a longing and a desire, an unhealthy desire, to satisfy my own cravings when it comes to food. Now I admit, I do not have the miraculous power to be able to turn stones into bread. But I do have a credit card. (laughs) And it feels miraculous. I got a fridge full of food. That feels miraculous. I got a pantry with lots of food. It feels like any time of day I want to go and get food, there is food to be gotten. I work at Calvary Church, and man, there is food here all the time. There's food in the break room. There's food in the kitchen. There's meals at everything. I think for most other people, we we don't really think about it, but for the people who've lived throughout history, What we have today feels as miraculous as this. That you can go to any grocery store any time of day. You can go to the pantry. That you can go to restaurants. All you can eat restaurants. That you can get whatever food that you want. That you can get snacks 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. This is the temptation to solve the cravings and the hunger that we all experience ourselves. And only recently have I come to realize, wow, this is a major temptation. It's not just with food. These are the cravings of our flesh. It can be for sleep, for sex. It can be cravings for vacation. It can be cravings for relaxation. It can be cravings for alcohol, for drugs. We have cravings in ourselves, and the temptation is for me to take it upon myself to satisfy those cravings. Hungry? Go get food. Some people are stress eaters, meaning they feel stressed and so they go get food. I am what I've discovered is what I would call a bless eater, meaning, well, why not? It would be a blessing. Go eat. The food is there. It feels good. It tastes good. Why not? The more the food, the better you feel. This is this temptation. For you and I to take it upon ourselves to bring the blessing that we long for. That's a physical temptation. It's our physical cravings. And Jesus being totally human, after 40 days, he knows the longing and the desire. Man, A loaf of bread would taste fantastic right now. The second temptation is more what we might call a social temptation or a psychological temptation. Satan takes Jesus up to the highest pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and says to him, why don't you jump off? This is not a temptation for the rush of bungee jumping or skydiving. What Satan is tempting Jesus with is the temptation of affirmation. Because what would happen, Satan knows it, the Bible says it, is that if Jesus were to jump off that peak, angels would come and catch him. Absolutely, no questions asked. Because Jesus cannot die this way. And so what Satan is tempting him with, he says, hey, look, If you're the son of God, do this, and then you'll get to see how much the father thinks of you. The second temptation is me seeking affirmation for myself. Jesus, you want to know for sure that you are the son of God in your human nature? Jesus, you want to know for sure that God will not abandon you to death? Jesus, you want to know for sure just how valuable you are? Jump off the top of this and you'll get to see a display that will prove it to you. This is the temptation we feel on social media. When we hear that voice saying, 
Post that it's your birthday and, and see how many people will respond. Post this picture of you. You look so good in it. So many people will see it and they'll tell you how good you look. Write this thing in these 144 some characters or whatever you get. People will think you're wise and witty. And it's a great pithy statement. It's the temptation for me to seek affirmation from myself. We feel this temptation at work. It can be in performance reviews. It can be in sort of keeping metrics on how well we're doing in status updates. Trying to show, well look, I've met all of my goals for the year. What do you think about that? It's a temptation we feel at school to tell somebody else what we got on it and ask them what they got on the exam, hoping that they will ask us in return what we got on the exam. Or us in school making a very negative comment about ourselves, just begging somebody to contradict what we just said. It's us asking the question, well, how do you think I'm doing? How do I look today? Did you like the meal I cooked? What did you think of the present I bought you? We all have a need for affirmation. The sin is not affirmation any more than the sin is food. The temptation is to, for me to take control of how much affirmation I get. For me to seek affirmation and validation of my own accord. It's more of a psychological and social temptation. The third temptation is one that usually, if you're familiar with the passage, we basically skip over. Because we think, well, this has no bearing on my life. Because what Satan does is he takes Jesus, somehow supernaturally, to a highest mountain in the world, maybe Mount Everest, I don't know if it's metaphorical, but he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and then offers them to Jesus. And I don't know about you, but the reason why when I first read that temptation, I just think, well, I've never really been offered all the kingdoms of the world, so I'm good there. And we get on. But I actually think this temptation is super relevant if we understand exactly what Jesus is being offered. So look what it says. It says that Satan showed him all the kingdoms of this world. And remember that kingdom is a power word. Kingdoms are related to kings. It's about power and authority. And then it says, and their splendor. Now you got to think, okay, well, what exactly did Jesus see? Well, the translators have translated this Greek word with the word splendor, which is a really great translation. But sometimes this word gets translated in other contexts with the word glory. So what are the splendor or the glory of the kingdoms of the world? Well, I don't know lots about other kingdoms, but I think about the kingdom of America, and I think, well, what is the glory or the splendor of America? Well, Hollywood's part of the splendor of America. Wall Street is part of the splendor of America. Harvard is part of the splendor of America. Silicon Valley is part of the splendor of America. West Point is part of the splendor of America. Washington, D.C., our Constitution, our justice system, these are parts of the splendor of America. When other people look at this country, they think, wow, they've got all of those various things, and these are the things that in the world's eyes bring America glory. So what is Jesus seeing? He's seeing all of these cultural institutions. He's seeing the arts. He's seeing movies. He's seeing the monetary system. He's seeing the legislative systems. He's seeing the economic systems of the world. And what Satan is offering to Jesus is cultural power. He's offering to him the ability to have all the movies coming out of Hollywood be holy and righteous and good and uplifting. He's offering to Jesus that all of the inventions in Silicon Valley, Jesus can be in charge of every one of them and they could all be life-giving. He's offering to Jesus the opportunity to be in charge of West Point and the military activities in this country and around the world so the military is only used for good purposes. He is offering to Jesus power and influence over Washington, D.C. so that all the legislation that is passed in this country and all the kingdoms of the world, it's all holy and righteous and good. 
this is what Jesus is being tempted with. And surely you and I can feel now the pull to be able to say, man, if I was in charge of all the legislation, if I was in charge of all the movies, if I was in charge of all of the markets and the way all things work, man, how cool would that be? And maybe I can exercise that same kind of power in smaller spheres. In the Lord of the Rings, like I said, one of the interesting things is, is that the corrosive nature of power, that power corrupts. And Tolkien is trying to show that, look, whoever gets this ring of power, it is in self dangerous. And so while there are lots of people who try to steal the ring from Frodo, there's only two and maybe three people that he ever really offers it to of his own free will. One is Galadriel. The other is Gandalf. And when Gandalf is offered the ring, he also is tempted, but this is what he says in response to that temptation. I would use this ring from a desire to do good, but through me it would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. Satan knows that Jesus would use the cultural systems of this world for good. But it's a temptation to take power and to use it his own way apart from the plan that the Father has. This is what Jesus is tempted with. This is what we are often tempted with as well. The first temptation is a physical temptation, the cravings of our flesh. The second temptation is a psychological temptation, the desire to create affirmation for ourselves. This third temptation is a power temptation, an attempt to wield and exercise cultural power, cultural influence, success, to accomplish the things we think should be accomplished, even if they are inherently good. It is the temptation to use power in our own means to achieve them. Jesus gives way to none of these temptations, not because he's not truly tempted, <laughs> but because he came to show us how you and I can also overcome temptation. Notice I said overcome temptation. I did not say avoid temptation because the ultimate goal of God is to help us learn how to overcome temptation. It's very powerful to me that the Holy Spirit is the one who led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. The Holy Spirit is not leading Jesus away from temptation. The Holy Spirit is leading Jesus toward temptation so that Jesus can overcome temptation and teach us how to do the same. So what can we learn about how to overcome temptation? Two hopefully practical principles and then a big overarching idea. First practical principle for overcoming temptation, fasting and prayer. Jesus is fasting in the wilderness for 40 days to get ready for this temptation. He is during that time not just not eating, he is also praying. You can get the sense of the magnitude of how much Jesus is tempted by how much he has to go through to prepare for the temptation. In order to be ready to say no to these things, he has to go through these 40 days of fasting and prayer in the wilderness. Why? What does that do for him? Well, fasting is a genuine, tangible way that we say no to our flesh. Amen. That we train ourselves. You, you ever had this feeling? Again, I think a lot about food. Well, I just, I'll eat, if I eat all of this food, I'll be fully satisfied. Does that ever happen for more than like a half hour? At Thanksgiving, when we eat lots and lots, are you no longer ever hungry again? No, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. Fasting actually works the opposite. By disciplining yourself and saying, I'm going to say no to my desires, your desires actually begin to decrease. The more you and I give in, the more they increase. And so the temptation that Jesus experienced, it requires 40 days of fasting 
to be ready for this. It also includes prayer. Why is that so important? Well, what Satan is tempting Jesus with at the ultimate level, you're better at running your life than God is. And what the 40 days Jesus has been doing in the wilderness, he's been interacting with God the Father and being reminded that God loves him, that God will take care of him, that God's plans are better, that when Jesus is offered all this stuff instead of the cross, God can be trusted. Not my will, but yours be done. So the same thing is for you and I. It's a very practical solution. If you struggle with cravings of the flesh, fast. If it's food, regular intermittent sort of fasting, coupled with prayer, praying through, Lord, help me to think through what I'm eating and what are you providing and what am I providing? Help me to think through, Lord, what is going on in these situations. Lord, is there something you can do with, I got to get rid of these snacks or I got to stop eating these kinds of things. That's what fasting is designed for. And we couple it with prayer. If you're craving sleep in the mornings, one of the things to do is fast from sleeping in. Okay, Lord, help me to get up in the morning and to pray. Pray for strength. Pray for help. This is what we do in the face of Satan tempting us. Hey, I got to get up on a Sunday morning. I just feel like sleeping in. If during the week you have fasted from sleeping in, you will be more fit and more in shape to say no when the temptation comes to sleep in when you shouldn't. If God is tempting you with affirmation, sorry, if Satan is tempting you with a need for affirmation, fast from social media or pray before you post something. I'm not saying you have to have a complete absence of it in your life, but have you stopped to say, Lord... Am I posting this because of the response I think I will get or because this might be a blessing to you and to others? Fasting and prayer. If during this political season you find a constant temptation to be engaged in politics and trying to find ways to bring about even good cultural kinds of things and you find this as a temptation to be a distraction, you can fast from politics. You can fast from being involved. You can fast from reading all of this stuff and spend the time praying for politicians, praying for those in leadership. The very practical suggestion in, that Jesus gives us through this passage is fasting and prayer. Jesus says later on in Matthew's gospel, pray so that you won't fall into temptation. And when Satan asked to do to Peter the same thing he did to Jesus... Jesus says to Peter, I'm praying for you. Fasting and prayer. The second practical suggestion from this passage is hearing from God through his word. You may notice that each time Jesus is tested or tempted, he responds with a passage of scripture. Now you might be thinking, okay, but are you saying that I would have to know scripture as well as Jesus in order to overcome temptation? Because if that's the goal, which of us is ever going to make it to that? I don't think that's the goal. Because you know who the person in the story is who knows the second most about scripture compared to Jesus? Satan. There's somebody else in this passage who is using scripture. So it's not simply how much scripture do you know. Let's look a little bit closer at how Jesus is using scripture to understand how we might be able to do the same. For this, I need you to look really closely with me in the Bible, especially if you have an NIV, because I know yours looks exactly like mine does, which is the translation that the church Bibles are in. If you look in verse 4, do you see all the way at the end of verse 4, there's a little superscript B. It's kind of in between the quotation marks. Does everybody see that? Yep, nod your head so I can see. Yep. You see that B? That's a little footnote that's going to tell us, uh, the translators and the editors are going to tell us where in the Old Testament that passage came from. Okay? If you look down in verse 6, at the end of the stuff that's kind of indented, the very end of the verse, you'll see a footnote C. Does everybody see a superscripted C? Yep. That's where Satan's quote is coming from. At the end of verse 7, you see footnote D. 
That's Jesus' second quote. And then at the end of verse 10, do you see at the last line you have a footnote E? Okay, that's Jesus' third quote. So now what you do is you look all the way down at the bottom of the page where you would expect to find the kind of the footnotes. And there you see A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. See where it says B? Right after that footnote B, there's a four, which means it's in verse four. And then do you see Deuteronomy 8, 3? Okay, that's the passage that Jesus is quoting from. So the editors have told us it comes from Deuteronomy 8, 3. So B, that's Jesus. C, that's Satan, the Psalm 91. D, that's Jesus. And E, that's Jesus. Now look at Jesus' three quotes. What do you notice about those three quotes? They're all from the same book, Deuteronomy. Even more than that, what chapters are they from? Six and eight. They're from the same section of Deuteronomy. Do you think that's an accident? What is Deuteronomy 6 through 8? It is Jesus' Bible reading for that morning. It's the passage of Scripture that he's been meditating on in the wilderness. How do I know that? The Spirit led him into the wilderness. It's no surprise that the Spirit also laid a particular passage of Scripture on his heart. Deuteronomy happens to be the book that is about Israel's sojourn in the wilderness. And that Deuteronomy, especially 6 and 8, but most of the book, is really about Israel and what they should do in obeying the Lord. This is what Jesus has been thinking about. This is what Jesus has been meditating on. And so he is giving answers to Satan's questions simply from his daily Bible reading. And the good news about this, if I told you that you and I needed to know as much scripture and understand it as well as Jesus, well, who would ever resist temptation? But the good news is, all you and I have to do is just obey whatever it is we just read. And even the newest Christian can do that. For example, there's tons of stuff in Matthew's gospel that you and I should do. But this morning, we're in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. And what the scripture in Matthew 4 says is fast and pray. And if you go home today and you think through whatever temptation Satan might be trying to tempt you with, when you go home and you feel that craving to go eat that food or you go home and you feel that craving to post something on social media or you go home and you feel that craving to read the stuff about politics and get all up in arms, all you got to do is fast and pray. You're like, well, what about the rest of Matthew? We'll get to the rest of Matthew's gospel. But today, it's Matthew 4, 1 to 11. That's what Jesus is doing, is he's recognizing the Spirit has him in Deuteronomy 6 through 8 for a reason. All you and I have to do is recognize the Holy Spirit has us in Matthew 4, 1 to 11 this morning for a reason. And if you meditate on this, if you obey this, whatever temptation Satan tries to trip you up with today, verses 1 through 11 will give you all you need to be able to say no. Those are the two very practical suggestions. The overarching idea, remember we said there are three temptations, but they're really just one. The temptation for me to displace God in being in control of my life, in being able to evaluate my life and being able to decide what I do, what I think of myself, what I accomplish, me, 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 me. The overarching solution to all temptation is submitting to God. It is letting God be in charge. Why does Jesus not need affirmation from God the Father by jumping off the top of the tallest part of the temple? Where was Jesus right before the wilderness? at baptism, where he submitted 
and did what God asked him to do, what did he receive at baptism? Affirmation. He heard God tell him, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus is not unhuman. He needs affirmation just like the rest of us do. It's just that he submitted to God and so he received affirmation, but it came to him the way God wanted it to come to him. And how much better if God the Father says out loud to you at your baptism, you are my son with whom I am well pleased than a bunch of angels catching you falling off a tower. Jesus has submitted to God and gotten the better thing. It's not that he gets no affirmation, it's that he gets the affirmation that God has provided. Well, what about food? Jesus is hungry. What happens at the end of this story? Angels come and do what? They make dinner for him. <laughs> he submits to God and says, it's not the Father's plan for me to turn these stones into bread. It's not that I can't do it. It's that I shouldn't do it. Not now. Ten chapters later, now is the time. But here, I'm going to trust and submit this is the Father's plan. And what does he receive at the end? An angel-cooked meal. He submits to God, and God provides. And now for the last temptation, and this is the trickiest one. Satan offers to Jesus cultural influence, power, to give to Jesus say-so over the movies produced in Hollywood, what West Point and the military forces are doing, what's taught at Harvard. These are the things that are offered to Jesus. But minus the cross, Jesus submits and says that was not the plan. Because cultural power and influence without the transforming nature of the Holy Spirit coming to change people's hearts Amen. is useless. Amen. All the great movies in the world, all the great legislation, all the great academic stuff, all of the great market stuff, apart from a transformed heart, that won't do any good. And so when Jesus submits to the Father, what does he get in return? we well, got to wait all the way to the end of the book of Matthew. When Jesus shows up after the cross, after the resurrection, what does he say? All authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. By Jesus submitting, he gets something far better than what Satan can offer to him. Jesus is given by God the Father all authority and all power in heaven and on earth, including over Satan. Satan's not offering that here. He says, I'll give you all this cultural power if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, I'm sticking with my Father's plan. And the Father's plan involved a lot more suffering, a lot more pain, a lot more difficulty, a lot more lack of control. But in the end, submitting to God brought the blessing. What is the key to any temptation you are going to experience or I'm going to experience today or for the rest of our lives? Give it to God. If you and I let God's will be done and not our will, we will overcome any temptation. Well, how do I learn to submit to God? Stick with us as we go through Matthew. We're going to learn lots of things from Jesus about how to submit to God. Today, all you got to learn is Matthew 4, 1 to 11. That when temptation comes, fasting and prayer, and using this passage that God is giving you today to help you say, okay, Lord, what do you want to have happen? This food, this affirmation, the culture, what do you want to have happen? Let me submit to that. Amen? Let's pray together.
Jesus, I do not believe we understand the depths to which you were tempted. We know what it feels like for us to be tempted. Help us to recognize that you know how it feels. Help us to know, Jesus, that you did not come to condemn us for all the ways we fail temptation, but to save us. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to show us a better way. That I know personally giving in to temptation over and over again, there's no life there. And so, God, I pray, Jesus, that we would follow your example and that you would set us free from every different way that Satan tries to tempt us. Give us eyes to see how fasting and prayer in your word can help us. Help us to submit to you, Jesus. And we pray for your mercy and your grace. For all our failings, all our shortcomings. Be merciful to us. And enable us, God, to follow your example. And to overcome the temptations that Satan will throw our way. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Because you have all authority in heaven and earth. Amen.